Lisa Lindstrom, and I'm the Chief Experience Officer of EY Consulting in EMEA. Today, I'd like to share with you the importance of putting humans at the center when we move into the future. And maybe some of you would think that this is a pretty scary picture of what humans would look like in the future. And I'm not saying that we will become something pretty different than we are today. But I love the fact that we have a speculative designer called Adi Haynes, who is triggering our minds a little bit of what it requires to be a human in the future. So first of all, I'd like to share with you my point of view, which is we don't have to be passive in what futures are going to be created. We could actually be active in shaping those preferable futures. So no longer, I think, we need to kind of look into the mirror of the future and say, what is the most possible, plausible, probably one? I think that all of us are able to shape that future that we want to see more of. And the future that I'd like to see more of when it comes to the intersection of digital and humans is basically that we don't need more screens. So digitalization for me does not mean putting in more technical stuff in every different parts of society. So for example, here showing what a hospital might look like in the future is not that preferred future that I wanna see. I think that we should use digitalization to really make sure that everything that can be automated, everything that a sensor can do, let them do that so that humans can connect with humans. So I'd like to see a digital world with no screens. I also think that some of the driving forces of creating this future is based on what we can do in technology. So I think that we are producing a lot of new features and new products and new services because we can. But I'd like to flip that and think of what are the things that we would like to do more of, for example, exercising, and in what way can technology help people to get there? Because we should. Thirdly, I think that the focus so far in the business world of creating really uh, successful companies built with tech at the center has been around, you know, why don't we plant many, many, many seeds and see in the kind of financial world what works. And then, you know, those are the companies that will succeed. What I'd like us to do is come together and work around a few big bets. So instead of having many, many, many companies, why don't we, like a company called Flagship Pioneering, take some of the biggest opportunities that are out there and place our thinking into a few big bets? That's the preferred future that I'd like us to see. And also in regards to innovation and innovation at scale, I think so often we think of it as digital innovation. But I'd like to introduce something that in India is called Yugat, so the everyday innovation. So the small things that we can do to improve people's lives here on an everyday basis, how could we foster a culture of that? Not everything actually needs to be digital in my opinion. I also see a cultural shift. I think that we have, you know, really based a, a, an innovation culture where almost like this, uh, you know, childish series of, of Professor Balthasar, who was inventing things for me, has to go away. And we need to include everyone and co-create those new 
products and services and innovations that is going to improve people's lives. So here we see a team of youth with rare diseases who are co-creating the type of services that would help improve their lives. I think that the quality of these services and I think that the equality of the things that we do needs to be designed with me. And when it comes to sustainability, uh, I think that there has been a lot in sustainability that is around shaming and that almost feels that, okay, this is more for me to do and it's adding up on my already busy agenda. Whereas, you know, what the last 18 months have proved is that by addressing the things that we do in new ways of working, we are also creating a more sustainable uh, planet, but also a more sustainable organization and maybe almost a more sustainable situation for me. I don't have to fly all over the world. I can do like I'm doing today. I'm meeting you uh, using the latest technology which is for me the perfect marriage between humans, technology, to create a more sustainable world. And lastly, the type of leadership that I think is going to be required to shape those preferable futures is to stop producing manuscripts about how we do the right thing and measure in a linear way how we get there, but in what way can we allow for our teams to explore and become true partners in shaping those preferable futures? So I'm now going to share with you a few clues or maybe a few learnings on how we get there. The first learning I have is that the type of leadership that is truly going to put the humans in your organizations uh, into you know, creating even more value is for leaders to let control go. My belief is that the harder the decision we're going to make, the more complex the decision is, include more people. So I've always practiced a very inclusive way of making decisions by inviting everyone in my organization to make those decisions with me. And I think that we are in an interesting shift where we are going from a very linear production society, where we go from you know, insight through a strategy, then we design or develop something new, we produce it and launch it, which is a very slow way of acting on customers' needs, we have now entered the listening society. And in the listening society, we need to have leadership that is musical from the different ways of working. And you don't work in the same way. Sometimes you start with a thought, sometimes you start with an insight, sometimes you start by just putting something out there, and sometimes you start with a strategy. And this requires a different way at looking at leaders. So if this is kind of the, the, the parallel operating system that exists, then, and very often we have this kind of uh, vision of where we want to go, I believe that to really utilize and get more out of the organization, we as leaders need to be the ones who remove the blockers for our teammates to develop the, the, the way forward. So here you see this in a very literal way where I asked the bank, what is between you and your vision? And they created this wall of challenges. And then I said to the leaders, well, you are the guys who could remove those blockers and really help the organization to uh, achieve their goals by not having these blockers in their way. So I think that to be able to shape those preferable futures with humans at the center in, in, you know, and using technology at speed, we need to let people who are closest to the customers make majority of the decisions and then let leaders remove the blockers. So this is a key thing for me. I'll say it one more time. I think that we need the people who are closest to your customers, make majority of the decisions, and then let leaders remove 
the blockers. I also believe that we should involve everyone. And to do that, I think that we need to translate some of the key things that we as leaders see into a pedagogical way of understanding something. So for example, here I translated our budget into poker so that I can invite everyone to the table to be part of creating the strategy of next year. And a strategy is very often manifested in a budget. So to, to really you know, invite people and make them uh, truly included to be part of making the budget, I translated it into poker and then they can help put the bets on the things that were important to them. And similarly, when I was thinking about, you know, opening up a new office for my company, I thought that was such complex decision. So again, I invited all my team members and I said, where in the world would you like to have an office? Unfortunately, the answer was not Oslo. And they said, we would like to have our next office in New York, which is the most complicated place for me in the world to open up an office. But I've trained myself to say yes five times before my first no. So I said yes, and I said, you know, how is this going to happen? And, you know, we did a survey and we said, uh, who is ready to uh, go to New York in the next three months and stay for two years and live on a very limited budget. Well, five people raised their hands and they created the business plan for establishing our New York office. And again, I was really curious to see, is this really going to work? But again, I said, okay, another yes, let's explore. Let's call it a prototype and let's see what happens. And this plan was so brilliant uh, and this team was then given the task to go and build a prototype of a New York office and it worked out super well. So it became a profitable uh, business from day one and this is one of the reasons why I feel that being truly inclusive has been some of the more important cornerstones in, in acting with speed. But to flourish in a complex world, we need to create a culture of learning. And a culture of learning is depending on how safe you feel. So I think that we should, as leaders, not only remove blockers, but our job is also to create safe zones. And safe zones are places where you feel trusted to explore, trusted to test, trusted to experiment, do new things, things that computers cannot do because we are original as humans. We can think in a way that a computer can never do and then celebrate the learnings. So I am actually not a fan of the expression failing fast because I don't think that there is a single person out there who wants to fail. But I do think that everyone around us is interested in learning. So as leaders, I think that we need to celebrate learnings and incentivize learnings and create a culture that feels safe for learning new things. And as I mentioned, I think we need to take inclusivity literally. And I think we need to do a lot of symbolic things to allow for diversity to flourish. But not just diversity in gender and in, uh, you know, the, the, the different social areas that you could come from. I also think that we should be inclusive in the way that we lead. So here's an example of a big management meeting for a telco where they uh, invited the top 150 leaders to crack and remove the blockers between them and their vision. And what is so fantastic about this picture, it's a symbol of how they then invited these 150 leaders to the top executive meeting. So here you'll see how everyone was invited to sit in and explore how a leadership or executive leadership meeting uh, takes place. 
And also they had two rotating seats here. So they invited people from the other circles around this uh, executive team to take place, to jump in, to be part of the decision making. And I think it's really important that when we talk about inclusivity, we are also doing it for real. So to shape those preferable future, it could sometimes feel that it's a, a, a too big of a challenge. You know, you have this little idea and then you already, your brain goes to a systematical change that feels enormous and you don't know how to get there. Well, my tip is why don't you just take that idea and test it? And don't do something big about it. Don't think about all oh, the organizational change. Don't think about the new business models. Don't think about how to go to market. Just test, build a prototype, see what happens. Is this a way to go to that preferred future? And if it is, and sometimes it works, it will lead to a behavioral change. It will lead to a shift both in the market, but also inside your organization. And then that in itself will lead to that systematical change, to that systems change. And lastly, this way of working is all depending on your curiosity, is all depending on how open you are to shape that preferred future based on people's needs and people's passions and people's joy and use technology as a catalyst to get there. But curiosity is a very human capacity. It's something that needs to be nurtured. So curiosity basically starts with you and you cannot be curious if you're stressed or not even if you're too target oriented. So my best advice and my send off to all of you is be human, human, be present, be you. Thank you.